This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll speak to two amazing climate leaders that will be featured speakers at the 35th Annual Bioneers Conference. The first, Martin Borg, Executive Director of Ecology Center, and Najari Smith, Executive Director of Rich City Rides. But first, the news. I'm Christina Onestead with KPFA News Headlines. Russia and China vetoed a U.S.-sponsored resolution at the United Nations Security Council today calling for an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Linda Thomas-Greenfield spoke in support of her measure. First and foremost, we want to see an immediate and sustained ceasefire as part of a deal that leads to the release of all hostages being held by Hamas and other groups and that will allow much more life-saving humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. Russia's ambassador to the United Nations, Vasily Nebenzia, said Moscow supports a ceasefire but questioned the language in the resolution, accusing the U.S. of misleading the international community for politicized reasons like voter support this election year. And to ensure the impunity of Israel, whose crimes in the draft are not even assessed. I wish to draw attention to the following. The U.S. draft contains an effective green light for Israel to mount a military operation in Rafah. Nothing would prevent Western Jerusalem from continuing their brutal cleansing of the south of the Gaza Strip. And what is Washington actually trying to achieve? Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he's ready to go it alone in a ground invasion in Tarafa, but he hopes the U.S. will support its efforts to defeat Hamas in statements he made after meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken today in Tel Aviv. The U.S., Qatar and Egypt have been trying to broker a ceasefire hostage swap deal between Israel and Hamas as the war drags on in Gaza. Israeli forces continue attacking the al-Shifa hospital. Witnesses say forces have shot at innocent people trying to flee. Israel said it's killed 140 Hamas members at al-Shifa. But according to the group Euro-Mediterranean Human Rights Monitor, witnesses told them IDF soldiers carried out unlawful killings and executions against displaced Palestinian civilians inside al-Shifa. World Health Organization director Thursday said they canceled a mission to the al-Shifa hospital amidst intense Israeli shelling. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus warned the future of Gaza's entire generation is in peril as hunger spreads across the Gaza Strip and children die of starvation. Governor Gavin Newsom's calling for a ceasefire in Gaza in a statement commemorating Ramadan. The governor acknowledged the deep pain the Arab American and Palestinian American communities are experiencing. And he said, I condemn the ongoing and horrific loss of innocent life, civilian life in Gaza. And he also said he supports President Biden's call for an immediate ceasefire as part of a deal to secure desperately needed relief for civilians and the release of hostages. The House MAGA Freedom Caucus is opposing the funding bill for six key agencies. Many Republicans are still supporting it, like House Speaker Mike Johnson. He's, though, having to rely on Democrats to ensure its passage. The $1.2 trillion measure combines six annual spending bills into one package. More than 70 percent of the money will go to defense. It also includes a 24 percent increase of detention beds for undocumented immigrants, a key Republican demand. Democrats' push for a $1 billion increase in funding for child care are also included. The White House is warning a proposed budget released by the Republican Study Committee includes a national abortion ban without exceptions for rape or incest. It says the budget would also gut contraception funding, puts IVF treatment on the chopping block, and endorses banning mifepristone, the FDA-approved medication for abortion. Democrats are trying to make reproductive rights and abortion an election year issue.
Six white former law enforcement officers in Mississippi were handed down 10 to 40 year prison sentences for torturing two black men who waterboarded, raped and shot them, then devised a cover up that included planting drugs in a gun. The six deputies and officers broke into the home without a warrant after a neighbor complained. The black men, Corey Jenkins and Eddie Terrell Parker, were staying with a white woman. Governor Gavin Newsom, former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jane Fonda, and environmental advocates will rally today against an oil industry-backed referendum to overturn a law aimed at protecting neighborhoods from toxic oil drilling. Suzanne Potter has more. A yes vote on the referendum would keep the restrictions in place. A no vote would repeal them. Senate Bill 1137 never went into effect. It's on hold until the vote in November. May Oil and gas interests argue that the changes could phase out thousands of wells as permits are not renewed and raise gas prices. However, a 2022 study from Harvard found that elderly people living near drilling or fracking wells are at higher risk of early death from diseases related to air pollution. Alex Walker Griffin is mayor of Hercules. He says poor air quality near oil and gas wells disproportionately affects neighborhoods of color. This is an issue that will plague low-income communities, places like Kern County. Those households that are nearby, those are farm workers. Those are people who are already at a disadvantage. So when I think about the folks in Compton and Watts, they're going to have one more reason why their kids are more likely to have asthma. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. Progressive lawmakers unveiled a Green New Deal for public housing on Capitol Hill Thursday. It would upgrade public housing by investing in energy-efficient appliances made in the U.S., adding electric vehicle charging stations, and electrifying public housing developments with a 10-year investment of up to $234 billion. It's backed by seven Democrats in the Senate, including Alex Padilla of California. It's supported in the House by more than 50 progressives, including Silicon Valley, Ro Khanna. It's World Water Day, and environmental advocates are calling on Congress to reinstate protections for streams. Suzanne Potter reports. Today is World Water Day, established 21 years ago by the United Nations to promote clean, fresh water. This year, advocates in the U.S. are pressing Congress to reinstate Obama-era Clean Water Act protections for smaller seasonal streams safeguards that were struck down last May by the conservative majority on the Supreme Court. Jim Murphy is senior director of legal advocacy at the National Wildlife Federation. With those protections now significantly scaled back, if we don't take action, we're going to see that type of pollution again. And especially with water under strain from climate change and other threats, Americans can't afford that. And that's Suzanne Potter reporting. Weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area. Partial sun today. Chance of rain this afternoon. Highs in the 60s. In Fresno in the central San Joaquin Valley. Partial sun today. Highs in the upper 70s. Chance of rain this afternoon. I'm Christina Onestead reporting for KPFA. Welcome back. We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Folks, KPFA is a media sponsor for the 35th Annual Bioneers Conference that starts next week, Thursday, March 28th, and runs till Sunday, March 30th. For those of you who don't know about Bioneers, it's a conference of minds converging on how to make our world a better place with focus on climate, conservation, progressive policies, and the like. And one of the featured speakers is Martin Bork, and he is the executive director of Ecology Center, which is based in Berkeley. Now, folks who don't know what the Ecology Center is, it's been around for over 50 years, focusing on improving the health and environmental impacts of urban Residents, Martin Bork, thanks so much for being on A Rude Awakening once again. It has been too long. How are you? I'm doing well. It's so great to be with you, Sabrina. 
Absolutely. So let's talk about the Ecology Center and um, what they have been up to lately. Uh, we were speaking off mic and it's been a lot of recovery um, from the pandemic, from the lockdown, and uh, just uh, getting folks to come back together again uh, around what the Ecology Center is and does. So talk to us about uh, talk to us about that that trudge forward up back up the hill. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of uh, local organizations uh, at, at the grassroots level are really going through similar stuff where. Uh, the pandemic's over and after a long shutdown and you know work from home and all of that um bringing community back together is is been slow going um you know we have people who have changed their lifestyles pretty significantly and um not necessarily out and about in the ways that they used to be and so we're excited for Bioneers. uh it's a place where that happens and where people will be coming together from around the country and it's just a, a, a incredible opportunity to network and meet people and um, sort of all the mycelial connections of the movement get stitched together, you know, across all these different sort of topical areas. And um, the Ecology Center has been a part of uh, Bioneers for many years. When they were in Marin, we did a lot of work uh, with Bioneers on the greening of the event and um, really supporting uh, the work to make the event itself have a smaller environmental footprint and um, thrilled to have Bioneers in Berkeley now. Uh, last year was the first year and it was a, a really great event. Um, Ecology Center itself is a 50-year-old organization, as you mentioned, um, founded in the run-up to the first Earth Day. And um, really the idea is that every community should have a place where people can come together um, get informed, get active, share ideas and 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 start things, you know, get get going on on projects that that are have a local impact but are um globally minded. So we've been a local organization from the beginning and thinking globally and acting locally and some of the core programs that have come out of that are um our curbside recycling program. It's the first in the nation started in 1973 and um, help to create um, recycling here in Berkeley and stitch together a network of recyclers throughout California and helped to pass the first um, recycling law in California that really required every city to have a recycling program and put um, zero waste and recycling and waste reduction, waste prevention um, as the solution as opposed to say um, burning waste. Um, and so, we use our local programs like the recycling program to inform uh, broader policy advocacy work and, and you know, use the opportunity that we have here in Berkeley with um, a very supportive community and a very supportive city council um, to try things out here locally and then see what, what works and then work, work to spread that more broadly. And that is wonderful to hear, wonderful to hear. And uh, there are a number of events that Ecology Center hosts. Um, talk to us about the, uh, the the upcoming event. This is the, I think it's the 23rd uh, annual uh, seed swap. Is that correct? Talk to us about that. Because, I mean, it's beyond being fun. Uh, it's it's great. You know, it's it's a wonderful way to meet folks that are, are you know, first time farmers or seasoned farmers. Talk to us about that, Martin. Yeah, it's just an amazing event uh, started by people in and around the Ecology Center, really a good example of um, what I was just talking about, of you know, people coming together in the community and seeing a need to be able to have um, open source seeds that are not controlled by um, major um, corporations or uh, genetically modified industries um, and to uh, be able to collect seeds and share them and, and preserve heirloom seeds and preserve seed varieties that do well in our local ecosystem and our local microclimates. Um, and, um, you know, it was a, an idea well before its time to start a seed library that was really community-based and um, open to anybody to, to bring seeds or to uh, uh, come and take seeds. So it's sort of a bring-take, you know, take-leave 
Um, and it's, you know, it's not fancy. It's, you know, a bunch of organized drawers in our, <laughs> in our resource center that hosts, um, you know, all, all kinds of different seeds from flowers to um, food. And um, the, the seed swap brings together, you know, really motivated, you know, people get really excited about this, this event. And, and so it's a, it's got a pretty high energy and um, lots of, lots of folks come out for it. Uh, and um, it's got a really nice community vibe to it. Um, in seed libraries um, in this this iteration, you know, were very few and far between. I don't know if it was the first or a first or something you know, when it started in um, like 20, 2001, I think was the first or 2002. Um, and, um, you know, now we're starting to see regular public libraries host seed libraries within, um, you know, as, as public libraries begin, you know, or are adjusting the services that they provide. Um, here in Berkeley, we have a tool lending library and we're seeing, um, you know, which is really amazing to have um, sort of a sharing economy being hosted by our public institution a, a, as a tool lending library. And that's now getting expanded uh, to include kitchenware, and you know other kinds of uh, tools and equipment that folks might use beyond sort of the um, construction or, or landscaping uh, sphere. And uh, currently, there's a council member Han has put forward a proposal to expand that to include things uh, like toys and 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 other kinds of um, uh, um, things that we can share and don't you know as a waste prevention strategy. So um, it's exciting to see seeds. And seed libraries expand. Um, uh, Richmond has a seed library now, um, mm -hmm. and we're seeing community groups that do uh, seed swaps uh, elsewhere. So it's it's you know exciting to see something um, that you know is spawned here and and, and other places uh, begin to get traction in in the broader world. Most definitely, most definitely, yeah. With uh, my virtual travels. Um, I have uh, come across a, a lot of folks, you know, a lot of farmers in the global south who just only deal with uh, heirloom seeds. And then you have uh, places or, or organizations like the, the Gates Foundation has created uh, this green revolution, so-called green revolution, where they're trying to force farmers in the global south, especially um, there's uh, 12 or 13 countries in on the African continent where they're just you know, pushing these GMO seeds and, and, you know, harmful pesticides. And um, it's just, it's a battle. It really truly is a battle. So having the uh, seed library there at the Ecology Center is definitely a plus. And folks just want to let you know, by the time this airs, the uh, seed swap will have already happened, but uh, there will be another one. And that seed library is there for your use, just like Martin Bork, Executive Director of the Ecology Center, has just stated, bring some seeds, take some seeds. It's a wonderful setup. It truly is a wonderful setup. And also the uh, website, ecologycenter.org, ecologycenter.org. And if you go to the first page, that splash page there, um, there is this resource, Your Path to Zero Waste. And talk to us about that. Um, that has come a long way over the last uh, six, seven years. Talk to us, Martin, about uh, zero waste and uh, how Ecology Center is, is helping folks get to that point of zero waste. Go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, the Ecology Center first got involved in recycling very, very early. You know, coming out of Earth Day, it was one of the things that uh, people could uh, get involved in immediately and take immediate action. And at the time, lots of people said, oh, you know, recycling, you're never really going to make a big impact. People won't really do it. Um, and uh, there were a lot of naysayers. And there were folks who said, oh, you're just enabling more consumerism. Um, and, um, you know, what we've shown through our pilot project 50 years ago is that you start something small, you plant seeds, um, it can really take hold and it, you know, it can really expand. And while it's both a, a place where people can take individual action and work towards um, being zero waste in, in your own home, um, 
you know, it's also uh, become part of our state national policies and, and now working globally on a, a um, international plastics treaty uh, to try and reduce plastic pollution. Uh, you know, it, it sort of spans that local individual to, um, you know, flexing not just our consumer muscle, but also our uh, citizen muscle and getting laws passed um, at the state level, at the national level, that can really prevent waste in the first place and um, do much better at addressing the waste that we are left with in, in more sustainable and, and healthy ways. And so um, the resources on our website are more geared towards individual action. Uh, we have a great um, app called uh, Resourceful. Uh, you can just Google Resourceful and Berkeley and you'll, you'll find it. And it helps you to figure out like, other than throwing something in the garbage can, what you might do with um, a whole range of things, not just those, you know, being able to see what is actually and isn't actually recyclable. So we do deal with a lot of wish cycling where people put in things in the recycling bin that they wish was recyclable. This will <laughs> tell you what is actually uh, recyclable and, and, you know, what we can actually sort and process. And our partners at uh, community conservation centers are the ones who actually bail and market those, those materials. Um, you know, if we can't uh, sort it and bail it and sell it, um, we, you know, it shouldn't go in the bin in the first place. So it's a great resource to figure that stuff out, but also like, what do I do with this old appliance? Or, you know, is there some place I can take this um, broken toaster oven? Or um, is there a fix-it clinic I can get involved in to uh, do some repair on something and, and, you know, keep it alive longer so that I don't have to um, waste, you know, waste a, a small household appliance or something that is actually pretty functional still, or that you have some deep affection for. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, we've got some great resources on, on the website. Uh, we also have a hotline and, and take uh, email inquiries um, to help people um, sort out uh, what is and isn't recyclable and how to move those things along that are no longer useful to you, but might still be useful to others. So, you know, textiles and shoes and um, furniture and uh, appliances and all, all kinds of other household goods. That is wonderful. Yeah. I'm taking a look at it here. Resourcefulapp.com forward slash Berkeley forward slash Berkeley. Um, it's, this is amazing. There's like an eco directory, uh, which has advocacy and volunteering. If you want to do that, uh, do it yourself classes, uh, just straight up education, uh, energy, uh, food and farming, garden, home, leisure, waste and recycling, water, sustainable products. And uh, yeah, this is this is amazing, Martin. This is really great. Yeah, it's the work of a lot of people over a very long time, <laughs> you know, accumulation yeah. of a lot of uh, information and, and uh, you know, keeping it all current is, is a big lift too. So shout out to our staff at the Ecology Center who keep that uh, up to date and, and moving forward. Um, mm. you know, I, I spend, um, some of my time focused on the public policy aspects of it. And so, you know, there's that individual action, which is so important, um, but also changing the rules around packaging for recyclability. And also just, um, you know, one of the main changes over the, over time in the recycling program, two, two big changes is that, you know, after the. Uh, the crash, the economic crash in, in 2008, 2009, newspaper just basically went away. And um, on the one hand, that's great, you know, that we're not using all of that newspaper, but, and, and a, you know, great source reduction uh, mm -hmm. thing that, that happened, but um, that was an economic backbone for recycling. Um, you know, that paper really had value. So it was a big, big change for recycling programs to go through to adjust and figure out how to move forward. Um, Obviously, the the surge in um, uh, cardboard with online purchasing mm -hmm. um, has made up some of those tons, um, but now we're seeing you know shifts from cardboard into plastic envelopes, and those envelopes you know often they have that recycling symbol on them, and they say you know bring to the store or return you know to to Amazon or wherever, and 
um, you know, those are not getting recycled and um, they are hard for us to sort and process and we have no markets for those. So getting the public policy in place so that um, we can find the packaging that delivers the goods and services, but is not uh, causing so much harm to our environment like plastic packaging does is really important. And here in California, um, two years ago, uh, SB 54 was passed, and this is a, a new approach to regulating packaging where it um, forces the packagers to take responsibility for the end of life of, of their packaging. And uh, it's the rulemaking is just happening this year, and it's moving um, forward pretty quickly. But um, uh, it uh, requires... Uh, all packaging in California to be recyclable or compostable. Wow. And it requires the packagers to um, pay into a fund to help make that so huh. and to redesign their products accordingly. It also has a big reduction goal, both in the terms in terms of total tons of plastic packaging, but also in the units. Sometimes they reduce the tons and it just the packaging gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and, and then it's harder and harder and harder to do anything with. Mm -hmm. So um, both counting tons and, and units. Um, but we should see some pretty significant changes in the way that products, goods, and services are delivered in, in California um, in looking to reduce um, the, the plastic packaging to begin with and to uh, prevent um, plastic pollution at its source as opposed to uh, mm -hmm. trying to do you know another beach cleanup <laughs> yeah yeah those are getting old they got old a long time ago <laughs> they really did that is wonderful so this is a uh, it's a test app it looks like here and uh let's see there's a uh, folks there's also a live chat you know so if you got any questions you can get in touch with the folks at ecology center if you have any questions um there's also a quiz test your recycling knowledge um, and you can get that information as far as uh, where you're at and, and knowledge and <laughs> recycling knowledge and uh, how you can further it, you know, push it forward. Um, yeah, that is wonderful to hear, making these companies take responsibility, you know, for creating that island of plastic out there in the Pacific Ocean and elsewhere. Um, for organizations really, really quickly, because I want to uh, get to what you're going to be talking about, get a preview of what you're going to be talking about uh, at Bioneers. Um, but uh, Martin Bork, Executive Director of Ecology Center. Uh, so this is a test project. Is this something that's going to be rolled out uh, at a later date? Um, is there a partnership with the state of California to roll this out um, to, to other businesses? Are you talking about resourceful? Yeah, resource. Yeah, um, um, you know, this was a really cool thing. A, a local developer um, was a passion project uh, for them. We worked very closely in um, developing the content for it. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are, are maybe a couple other cities who've signed on and are using it. Um, nice. But, you know, that's uh, really up to resourceful to, to expand. There are some other good resources like it. There um, is Earth 911, which... Um, you know, covers much greater geography, but isn't necessarily as locally um, detailed as resourceful. And also Alameda County's uh, stopwaste.org has a good search tool um, that uh, it covers, you know, a broader geography than than just uh, Berkeley and the immediate surrounds. Um, Wonderful. But, um, you know, again, I think the, the local individual action is really important. We it fits in, you know, it fits into this broader context through the early 2000s and 2010s. We had the American Chemistry Council uh, and the plastics industry telling everybody that all plastic was recyclable. And they really pressed on this to get local recycling uh, programs to accept all plastics. And in Berkeley, um, we eventually did that when we had a direct line of sight to a processor. Uh, in China that we felt was doing a decent job with decent, certainly not, um, uh, wouldn't have uh, gotten permitted in California, but they had decent environmental controls and this was in, in China and um, that market fell apart pretty quickly. And so, mm -hmm. you know, all these 
uh, plastics, the non-bottle plastics. Um, they call them a three through seven mix or uh, mixed plastics. Um, you know, many uh, cities in California were exporting those uh, overseas, mostly to China and Southeast Asia. Right. And there was some recyclable material in there, but a lot of it was getting dumped and burned. And so we've been really pushing back against that. We um, uh, we only process and, and sell here, here in Berkeley, number one and number two uh, bottles. So that would be, you know, uh, beverage bottles and then things like shampoo bottles or detergent jugs or milk jugs, uh, number one and number two plastics. So all the other plastics that gets in our program gets sorted out and, and sent to the landfill. We'd much rather have it here in California in a landfill than being exported someplace where we can't uh, see what's happening with it and uh, be concerned that it might be being dumped or, or burned. Yeah. Including somebody else's environment. Like, the, uh, you know, waste diversion shouldn't be diverting it from our environment into somebody else's backyard. Right. Exactly. So, exactly. So, that, and that's the thing. It's, it's really, conf it has been confusing for a lot of folks. You know, they just think that, oh, they see the little uh, the recycle emblem, you know, and it'll be on some thin plastic uh, container. And it's like, oh no, that's not recyclable. I learned from the ecology center what's what's recyclable as far as plastics are concerned. So uh, yeah, plethora of knowledge, folks. Ecologycenter.org, ecologycenter.org. So let's go ahead and close this out. Mr. Martin Bork, executive director of the Ecology Center. Talk to us, uh, give us a little preview. We got a few minutes here and give us a little preview of what you're going to be uh, talking about at Bioneers. And what yeah, so la last year at Bioneers, we talked about plastic. You know, we had a great panel <laughs> covering what I just talked about <laughs> with some activists fighting incinerators in Detroit and, and uh, people on the front line of plastic pollution in Texas. And, um, and so that was really great. This year, we're kind of doing a similar approach, but focused on food and farming and food access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And um, but really take it. The session is called Seeds to Systems. And it's about this idea of really, you know, being able to take small localized projects and how do you scale them up? And mm -hmm. so uh, the Ecology Center uh, has been working on this in terms of scaling up a healthy food incentive program. It matches federal food benefits, CalFresh or what used to be called food stamps at farmers markets across the state. And um, Minnie Foreman, who is our director of food and farming, uh, will be presenting on, on that program. I'll be moderating a panel with her and um, Javier Morales, uh, who is the executive director of the Praxis uh, Project. And uh, he'll be talking about similar approach, uh, looking at soda taxes. So here in Berkeley, we passed nation's first soda tax and that's been spreading. What does that look like to be able to generate local source of revenue from the uh, the soda industry, taxing the soda industry, um, and using that revenue to um, build health awareness, to um, work on health equity, to build uh, the voice and power of local community organizations, um, and you know how do you plant that seed and 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 see it grow? And then um, uh, I've also got the in, the executive co director of uh, the National Farm to School Network. We'll be pre presenting and you know this is just really exciting work that started with you know individual schools or districts trying to get uh local fresh foods into their school lunch programs and uh, that has really grown you know we've done a lot of that work here in berkeley with the school lunch initiative and cooking from scratch and bringing in uh, locally sourced foods um here in berkeley but it's you know it's happening all over the nation and has really blown up and um, you know, some of these programs started out, like I said, as, you know, individual community-based projects and now have these big networks and are getting state and federal funding and becoming um, nationally recognized and, um, you know, built into our systems now in school districts and um, uh, in, in um, with, with state funding. Um, mm -hmm. We're currently fighting a battle to try and save funding for this market match program that matches uh, nutrition incentives, uh, uh, matches food benefits, 
CalFresh, EBT mm-hmm. in California. And uh, the governor has um, proposed to cut funding for that program. And so we, we were just yesterday doing a big lobby day, um, trying to turn people out. And uh, we talked to dozens of, of legislators to keep that funding in the, the state budget for next year. Um, even though there are significant cuts coming down at the state level. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so um, this, this session at Bioneers is really covering, you know, how do you take that, that seed and grow it into something that's substantial and, and, and significant and long lasting and, and, uh, and has an impact at scale. Absolutely. Well, it's about the constituents, you know, I mean, uh, the pre-budget that came out at the beginning of the year, uh, significant, significant cuts to uh, climate, uh, huge cuts. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. California, sorry, uh, California prides itself on being, you know, really right. supportive of the social safety net. Right. And uh, many of the safety net programs were protected in that initial budget proposal that the government put out in January. Um, mm-hmm. But this one, because it lives in the California Department of Food and Agriculture, I didn't get lumped in with the other safety net programs. And so we're, we're really fighting an uphill battle to, to protect it. Well, we'll see what happens in May and uh, yeah, just keep up the, uh, cause that's when his final comes out and uh, yeah, and it's supposed to go to what, to the, uh, go to the Congress, uh, state Congress and, and uh, go through that whole process. But uh, yeah, lobbying efforts and uh, folks, it takes people like you, you are the constituents you know, we are the people that vote these other folks in, you know, and let your voice be heard and uh, show up at the Ecology Center and check out what they're doing and check out their website and become knowledgeable of how you can activate yourself, activate others in your community, come together and uh, make a better world, make a new world. What day will you be doing your thing, Martin Bork? Yeah, Saturday, March 30th, uh, we have a 415 session, and um, it's going to be uh, a great set of panelists um, talking about how to start new projects and scale them up. Um, but uh, the whole day is going to be pretty fantastic. The Bioneers does a, a the plenary session at Zellerbach, and it's thousands of people in an amazing space with um, really incredible um, speakers, uh, very inspirational, and just very cross-sectional, you know, it just covers so much ground and, and, and stitches together all these um, different um, threads in, in, in various movements. And uh, it's just an, an amazing uh, conference to be part of. Most definitely. So at the top, folks, I said March 28th, Thursday, March 28th, to Sunday, March 30th. It's actually Saturday, March 30th. So Thursday to Saturday starts next week, Bioneers 35th Annual Conference. And uh, Martin Bork, 415, he will be there uh, with an amazing panel talking about food and farming and and food accessibility and uh, everything under the sun in regards to climate as well. Martin Bork, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Once again, it's been too long. I definitely will not let so much time pass. Definitely want to talk to you again in the very near future. Thank you so much. Great to be with you today. Thanks a lot, Sabrina.
back. We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs, one of the featured speakers. Uh, ooh, scratch that. Three, two, one. Welcome back. We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. The 35th Annual Bioneers Conference will be featuring a plethora of speakers with a climate and conservation focus. The conference starts next week on the 28th and it runs through the 30th to the 30th of March. And one of the featured speakers is the founder and executive director of Rich City Rides. Rich City Rides is an organization that promotes riding a bike as a primary mode of transportation. So bikes instead of cars. Folks, here to talk about this amazing organization is Najari Smith. And Najari Smith is a lifetime community advocate and founding executive director of Rich City Rides. Najari has served the city of Richmond, formerly as chair of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, as an arts and culture commissioner, and currently as human rights and human relations commissioner. Najari Smith, it is so wonderful to have you back on a rude awakening once again. It's so wonderful to have you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for taking the time. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for your interest in what you know the things that we've been doing with Rich City Rides. Um getting people out of their cars, getting them on bikes, getting them to embrace an alternative green healthy mode of transportation. Um Mm -hmm. We've, I want to tell you about the, our role in the transformative climate communities. We call it the TCC project. Uh, it's a state program that we're working with the city of Richmond, along with um, six additional organizations who each have a role in bringing some, some really good things to the community. Wow. Um, yeah, let's hear about it then. Yeah, because that is uh, getting anything out of the state of California as far as climate is concerned. It's uh, it's it's been been a little rough going there. But go ahead. Yeah, I mean we it's you know like right in in this moment with there being so many climate catastrophes, it's more important than ever that we do what we can to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, TCC um, program is supporting several projects that are um, going to help people and help um, reduce the reduce our carbon footprint overall. We're solarizing houses um, with grid alternatives. We're um, transforming outdoor spaces with the ADA accessible garden that Urban Tilth is is leading. We're um, um providing laundry to landscape and for rich city rise what we're bringing is an, an electric um bike lending library we call it the e-bike lending library and this will be a continuation of what we've been doing at the on the richmond greenway um where we've we've worked previously to bring um unity park to the to the greenway at 16th street we want to activate this entire Richmond Greenway, which is a 3.1 mile linear park. Um, our main area has been 16th Street, where we have the Rich City Rides um, Bike Hub. Uh, from the Bike Hub, we host workshops on how to um, how to repair your bike. There's a bike clinic. People can bring can bring their bikes to the bike clinic and. We have um, we have mechanics that will that will get their bikes up and running again. So on a first come first serve basis, we also use this as a hub for our Everybody Rides program. So through our Everybody Rides program, we've been able to provide over thirty five hundred bikes to community members for free. These are refurbished bikes. Some of these bikes are new, um, and we've been using this as our method of building relationships with our community and, um, you know, getting people to, to activate the park and introducing them to a, an alternative mode of transportation. Yeah. The e-bike lending library is going to be our next step in this. 
Yes, that's uh, that's exciting. That is absolutely exciting. Now, talk to us about that. The the e bike lending library. That's um, yeah. Talk to us about that, Najari Smith, please. <laughs> Yeah, the e-bike lending library is going to allow us to provide 40, um, 40 e-bikes to the community. We'll have a site on the Richmond Greenway at 17th Street. Um, we'll house 40 e-bikes in there at a time. People can come and rent one of those e-bikes. Well, not rent it, borrow the e-bike, kind of like borrowing a, a, a book from the library. Um They'll be able to hold on to the bikes for up to a week, and we're gonna um, we're gonna as a part of this program. I'm, I'm excited about the volunteer training and maintenance program, where participants will be able to come to several workshops, and at the completion of that of of, of that program, they'll be able to take one of the e bikes home with them for free. It'll be their e bike. Oh, oh gosh, that's exciting! <laughs> that is exciting. Well, just really quick, you know, it's it, it, it's the the psychology too. You know, it's like it, a day, okay, two days maybe. You know, that's gonna kind of change people's minds. You know, and that, usually they're doing it out of desperation because they can't, you know, uh, they can't use their car or whatever. But when you give a week for somebody to be able to rent out a bike. You know, that really adds to the psychology of, wait a minute, I, I, I like this better. You know what I mean? To, to really um, take in the benefits of riding a bike as opposed to driving a car. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, it's just absolutely, you, you, you said it. And, you know, one of the, that's the beautiful part of letting people hold the bike for not just a day not just a couple hours, you know, they're not under any, they're not under a tight time constraint to get this back to us before the e-bike landing library is closed um, for the day. They can hold on to this bike for multiple days. They can bring it back. We'll have staff at the e-bike landing library throughout the week. So if they have any, you know, any questions about how to use it, there'll be somebody there that can give them some answers to talk them through it. Um, we want to hear about how the bike is impacting their lives, you know, um, are they, you know, is it helping them to get to, to public transit? Is, is it helping them to run their errands? Are they able to be less dependent on their car if they have one and, um, you know, just how the bike is working out for them and, um, being able to hold on to this bike for a week, you know, for folks who are, you know, we're hoping that it, that they embrace it and they are less car dependent overall and that they are at a point where they they want to keep the bike they'll and they'll join up they'll sign up for the volunteer training and maintenance program and have the bike as their very own yeah that yeah. Is wonderful. that is absolutely Wonderful. This is wonderful. So are there any other organizations uh, uh, here, in, here in the state of California or uh, anywhere in the country? Uh, I'm sure they've got them in Europe, especially in those Scandinavian countries. They're big on riding bikes. But uh, are there any other organizations like yours that are doing what you do in Najari Smith? Um. As far as like e-bike lending libraries, I've heard of some. Your whole organization, actually. <laughs> I mean, I know that we we do have some fantastic bicycle organizations here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know of any. I don't know any organizations off the top of my head that are actually doing e-bike lending libraries anywhere in the Bay. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully, this is a this be, this creates a a trend. I see that there's a. I would love to see e-bike lending libraries popping up in other areas. You know, I, I wish that there was, you know, when um when I, you know, I kind of with the creation of the bike hub, e-bike lending libraries, like things that um I've heard people would like to try out. We have a 
a program within Rich City Rides now where people can can um borrow an e-bike, you know, and we did this as a way of getting people to the opportunity to join our rides if they didn't feel like they could, you know, if they were concerned about how long is the ride, how many miles are we going? Well, the e-bike, the e-bike will allow you to, you know, keep up um, and you know, be less have less anxiety about how far you can ride and allow you to just enjoy riding with the group, um, joining our 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 community group tours. And um, you know, it's kind of like that first step. It's so much fun riding with the group. Um and we know that the more you ride, the more you ride. <laughs> like literally. <laughs> <laughs> that um you know it, it feels like <laughs> it feels like we're um it's like the rabbit hole of bike riding it's like once you go on one ride you go on another ride and before you know it you're riding all the time and um you know it fits it fits our overall goal of wanting to to reduce our carbon footprint by having more people embrace green transportation and be less dependent dependent on um on having to drive and you know less wear and tear on a car and just more freedom yeah yeah a lot more freedom a lot more freedom that is wonderful so najari smith Jerry Smith, lifetime community advocate and founding executive director of Rich City Rides, richcity.org, richcity.org, folks. Um, Najari, when are you going to be appearing at Bioneers? What day are you going to be there next week? I'll, my panel is going to be at Bioneers on Saturday, March 30th. Um, it's starting at three o'clock. We'll be on from three to 4.15. Um, we'll be located at the, um, the Marsh Theater, um, upstairs in the Marsh at, um, 2120 Alston Way in downtown Berkeley. All right. All right. That is wonderful. So the 28th and give us that time again, one more time. Enjoy. Um, the 30th, oh, sorry. March 30th, March. No All right. And the time again from 3 PM to 4 15. All right, 3 p.m. to 4.15. A lot of amazing knowledge there to be had, folks, at Bioneers next week. Najari Smith, this has been, uh, it's been wonderful catching up with you. We got to... We got to talk some more, have a longer conversation about uh, what Rich City Rides is going to be doing, still doing, and uh, how the public, how the community can can get involved and get connected. Uh, folks, it's all about trying to reduce that carbon footprint, just like Najari said, uh, getting out of the car, you know, and uh, getting on a bike. Just get on a bike. And I'm guilty of it. I'm trying to get myself motivated to do it too. Um, but talk about a, a, a positive, a positive lifestyle change. Najari, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. And um, yeah, folks, look forward to seeing him speak on the 30th. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Again, folks, to get more information about the Ecology Center, just go to their website, ecologycenter.org, ecologycenter.org. And everything we discuss is uh, right there, right there on that splash page, uh, the resourceful app dot uh, com forward slash Berkeley. So you can learn more about uh, recycling, get more educated about the uh, solar panels, uh, you name it, anything climate leaning, you name it, and that information will be right there. And then of course, Rich City Rides, Rich City Rides, that's richcity.org, richcity.org. You can get more information about the e-bike library. That is just so exciting. And uh, just a get some help with transitioning from being in a car to being on a bike and again folks both of those amazing people martin borg and najari smith they are going to be at the bioneers conference the 35th annual bioneers conference and there, there's going to be a 
plethora of speakers featured with a climate and conservation focus. Uh, Rebecca Solnit's going to be there. David Solnit's going to be there. Naomi Klein. And uh, yeah, now more than ever, it's time to make the transformation needed to save Mother Earth. Be a part of the Pioneers community of leadership in this time when we're all called upon to be leaders. So come on out to Bioneers 2024 and that's hashtag Bioneers 2024 March 28th, 29th and 30th. Again, March 28th, 29th and the 30th to join forces for a brighter future. You can get registered at conference.bioneers.org. That's conference.bioneers.org. You can check out the calendar and uh, find the time and location of the speakers that you would like to see. So hope to see you out there um, 28th, 29th, or the 30th, or all, both, all three days. <laughs> And also, folks, just want to let you know about an event that KPFA is co-sponsoring. Uh, we all live in Gaza. We all live in Gaza. Benefit to support Gazan artists, musicians, and journalists. There will be food, music, a documentary film, conversation, and Gazan art on display. And there will also be a discussion with Ziad Amrush, that's the executive director of the Middle East Children's Alliance. And this event is tomorrow. It's uh, Saturday, tomorrow, March 23rd from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. That's 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Starry Plow. 3101-3101 Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley. Partial proceeds will go to support KPFA. This event is wheelchair accessible, and for more information and tickets, you can go to we-gaza.com. That's w-e-g-a-z-a.com. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guests, Martin Bork and Najari Smith, for taking the time. Always Real Rodicule is on the controls. I'll be back next week, same time, same place. The music on today's show was Maurice Luca and Bikia with betrayal stay tuned for a rebroadcast of democracy now coming up next and remember good people embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all thank you for listening award-winning journalist and host of Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman will be in Berkeley to honor KPFA's 75 years of building community trust. Amy has a long and valued relationship with KPFA and will offer her unique perspectives on our 75-year history. The program will be hosted by Brian Edwards Teaker. Tickets are on sale now. Get yours early and support the Bay Area's truly independent media outlet. Complete details at kpfa.org. I am truly amazed by you, our KPFA listeners and supporters. My name is Italina, Donor Relations Manager here at KPFA, and you may have received a phone call from me thanking you for your kind support of the station. Thank you for your heartfelt words doing these calls, thanking the staff, and showing your appreciation for our programming. Thank you for being a monthly sustainer, and thank you for your one-time generous donations. William Shakespeare wrote this poem. It's a 116th sonnet that starts, Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. So this is my black English translation. Don't let me mess up partner happiness because the troubles start and I ain't got the heart to deal. That wouldn't be real about love if I push come to shove just punk. Now hardly, hey, love do not cooperate with cop-out provocations, no. Storm come, storm go away, but love stay steady if you ready or you not. Love, true love stay steady, true love stay hot. June Jordan, a voice synonymous with passion, integrity, and vision. No other station has been bringing you voices like these except KPFA. 
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.